much easier to get here from Canton, Mission, Michigan than Canton, China. So, well, please uh, open your Bible and have those with you. And we will continue pretty much where we left off last time when we were looking at Paul's conclusion, his preparation for his conclusion in his letter to the Thessalonians. And you know, the continuing Christian life is a life of reminders of learning to please the Lord and walking in a manner worthy of our calling. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul is making bullet point at the end of his letter to his friends. We recall the request and the series of commands that we looked at last time in verses 12 through 14. If you turn there, 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning in 12, and recall, Paul has written, he says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and over you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work and to be at peace among yourselves verse 14 he says we urge you brothers to admonish the idle to encourage the faint-hearted to help the weak and be patient with them all all of these commands and this request have to do with our horizontal relationships uh, including with one another and this includes within and among and between all of us as families, as husbands, as wives, as fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, siblings, bosses, workers, friends, fellow workers, and even non-believers. You will recall that we pointed out to whom the request and the command was made last week, that, they were di- uh, that, that these uh, commands were uh, dire- who they were directed to We talked a little bit about the heart attitudes of obeying this request and these commands that are directed to each one of us. It's not something that's reserved just for the elders or the pastors. And uh, we showed that the attitude and the motivation behind obeying this command and these um, this request and these commands is love. Well, in the same way, Paul has given these bullet points uh, as reminders. I will be giving you reminders for the Christian life. And one request that I would have is that you would open your door, that you would open the door of your heart because I'm coming in your kitchen. Now let me pick up with the sixth and the seventh commands where we left off last time and continue part two of attitudes and conduct good for growth. So turn in your Bible there to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look down at verse 15. Today, we're just going to be covering one verse, verse 15. Let's read that. It says, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. See that no one, no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Now, this reminder that Paul has given was not given because there was a gross deficiency among the brothers and sisters in Thessalonica. It is a reminder to press on and to excel still more. You'll recall that Paul had just earlier given thanks for the Thessalonians having been taught by God himself through the Holy Spirit to practice love for one another. But the need for this bullet point may be due to a need for growth in some of the brothers and sisters that Paul is writing to. Perhaps Timothy had reported that some there had an immature tendency to, re- to react to offense by retaliating. Perhaps this practice was going unchecked with a predictable outcome of, of spreading like a mold over the brothers and sisters. In any case, it's clear that our fallen nature requires reminders and oftentimes reminders of reminders of what our Savior enables and expects in our lives and among us. The request and the seven commands all give instruction, as I said, about our horizontal relationships among us and between us. Today, what we will do, and and there's a handout in your um, bulletin there if you want to take notes there, what we will do is we will look at specific application of God's word in our hearts as we consider some of the details in the relationships among us as we work to obey. We will look at our hearts and we'll ask 
how it is that we can justify returning evil or withholding good. And we will look at strategies on how to obey these last two commands with regard to our tongue and our temper. And then we will examine the key to genuine freedom from vengefulness. And then finally, we will examine the consequences if we refuse to obey. So as I said, I hope your hearts are open this morning to what the Lord will do through his word and the Holy Spirit. Well, now let's, let's focus on this verse, verse 15, and let's break this verse down. These final two commands so that we can better understand what Paul has written to the Christ followers there in Thessalonica. Verse 15, remember, says, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Well, this first uh, verb here that comes across in English as see that is an imperative. It's a command. So Paul has given this as a command, and it's uh, to be directed, it's directed to all to carry out. So this is not a command directed to some and not to others. It's to everybody. And it says to make sure, or the, the verb there means to stare at or to discern clearly, to pay attention to. Uh, we can extend this to mean to look after one another's hearts. Uh, other times in scripture, Paul uses this construct of see to it. This is a little bit of a different construct, but he says, see that. And there, is, there are implications individually as we pay attention to our own hearts, and there's implication corporately or corporally as we consider one another's hearts. So what does that look like? I, I want you to be open to this question. What does that look like to apply this with one another? And certainly it does not mean that we patrol as heart police after one another. But there are implications individually as we look at our own hearts and implications for us as a body as we look after one another's hearts. So let me give you a couple of references. You might want to write these down uh, that also indicate this, this, same kind of, um, this same kind of openness here. Proverbs 28 verse 23 says, Whoever rebukes a man will afterward find more favor than he who flatters with his tongue. So this is speaking about bringing or speaking the truth in love. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. And then Paul in Galatians 6, verse 1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So you can see there these implications of looking after one another's heart as we preserve the bond of unity among us in the body. So that's the idea of make sure. Then this, this Paul's writing is, is very, as we said last week, is very rich, it's very complex. And yet in, the, in this series here, he's writing his bullet points and he's being very, very direct. And this verse here, uh, verse 15, is very straightforward. It, it means exactly what it says. There's nothing hidden in here, but if we, as we open it up, we can understand how to apply this. So this uh, next word of note is repay. See that no one, no one means no one, means inclusive. No one repays. Well, what does repay mean? It quite literally means to give back. So if you've received something, then to repay means to give the same thing back to them. So here he's saying, see to it that no one repays or no one gives back what they've received. So if, if someone has received an offense, the exhortation here is don't pay that offense back. Okay, very straightforward. And then it says, pay, uh, repay, uh, see that no one repays uh, anyone. Is anyone inclusive or exclusive? It's inclusive, meaning anyone, meaning everybody. And then this word evil. This word here for evil is the most, uh, the broadest definition of evil. It's, it's anything that's worthless or depraved or injurious. So 
pay nothing evil back. Nothing evil back. Then look at this next word. We have a comma. We have a uh, conjunction there. But always. And this word, Paul uses this word quite a bit. And it means uh, always. <laughs> it means all the time. And in Greek, it's made up of two words that mean, I think it's kind of cool, every when. Every when or every time or all the time, therefore always. So always, always to do good, seek to do good to one another and to everyone. And this verb seek there is sometimes translated as pursue. And it has the sense of keep doing it. Uh, hooray, we've done it once. We must seek doing it. Remember this these exhortations from Paul, uh, from Paul to press on, to excel still more. So praise the Lord, if you've been able to seek to do good to one another, keep doing it. That's the sense there of this verb, to keep doing it, keep pursuing, do good. And then what is good? It's blessing. And it, this, like the evil, was an all-inclusive word for anything injurious or depraved. Here, good is a word that means good. So when you ask yourself, well, what, how, what can I do to do good? It's a blessing. How can you bless someone? Consider how you can bless someone, how you can bring blessing into their lives. And he says then to bring this blessing to one another. So as you consider your horizontal relationships with those in this room, with those in your home, with those in, in Christ that you know, your friends, that's who you can seek to do good to. But does Paul stop there? No, he, he goes on and he says, and to all or to everyone. And then again, this is an inclusive thing. He's, he's saying there to any or to all or to the whole. So this is uh, to, to be to everybody, not limited to just the believers. Okay, So it's a very, very straightforward reading. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil. But always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. And this is the expected standard conduct in the Christian life. Verse 15 certainly has to do with the horizontal relationships within and among and between us as families. And as I said, husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, siblings, bosses, workers, friends, relatives, co-workers, believers, and extending even to non-believers. So husbands, let me ask you directly to examine your own hearts, especially toward your wives in light of verse 15. Let me read it again to you so you can examine your heart. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Wives, <coughs> let me ask you, where's your heart with regard to verse 15? Certainly, together, we would agree that there's, that, that there's, that any act of revenge or, or vengeful attitude or spite, there's no room for it. Let me read for you a series of commands and series of exhortations to prod you along here. As we hear these instructions from Colossians, Ephesians, and 1 Peter, we must examine our deepest attitude toward those that are nearest to us. So listen on these reminders. You could write these references down if you want. Colossians 3, 19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Show honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And a few verses later in 28, and in the same way, husbands, 
should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And allow me to remind you of this injunction from 1 Peter 4, verse 8. This is directed to us all. Peter says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. In light of these very clear instructions, is there any room for a vengeful attitude and spite? There's no room for a vengeful attitude and spite. And let me add this. There's no room, really, for pouting or even the silent treatment. <coughs> yeah, but you don't understand what she did to me. <coughs> yeah, but if you knew about him, what I knew about him, you'd see the reason why I treat him like this. Feeling sorry for ourselves does not justify returning evil for evil. Pouting is selfishness. Likewise, a cold shoulder or the silent treatment cannot be sanctioned as acceptable in the heart of a wife seeking to please her savior. A husband pursuing godliness will work at respecting his wife without pouting or trying to punish her. Pouting and the silent treatment are due to a lack of maturity, and certainly there is room for growth. Confessing or acknowledging a wrong attitude with a, I'm sorry, or will you forgive me, will help us move toward harmony and help keep our hearts open toward one another. Seeking to do good includes helping one another, keeping our hearts and our feelings open. Then with open heart and open feeling, we can come together and talk about the issues that are creating friction between us and bring one another back into the fellowship with God and to one another. And if we don't do that, we might never talk about the issues. We might withdraw from one another or just argue with one another. Husbands, we are the guardians of our wives' hearts. Both husbands and wives are encouraged to connect with God and should encourage one another to connect with God to restore the vertical fellowship that therefore enables the horizontal fellowship. Can I get an amen? Amen. So in light of the Lord's presence with us, how can we justify any meanness toward anyone, especially those nearest to us? But we often do. We often do, don't we? Brothers and sisters, we must identify and reject this practice. When it really comes down to how and why we justify this brand of, of selfishness, it really is because we are worshiping wrongly. Or said in another way, we're worshiping the wrong target. The heart that will justify or self-justify this practice, these attitudes and this behavior, is really worshiping itself rather than our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Pastor Kerry Skinner says it this way. He says, <coughs> if you see this pattern of sulking and pouting in your life when you don't get your way, it's not because you have a deep character quality of walking with God. No, he says, the problem is you have a deep character quality of walking with self. So to be a husband or wife in pursuit of godliness requires that we first surrender our lives to the lordship of Jesus Christ. When the Holy Spirit lives in us, he empowers us to live godly lives. And just as Paul was thanking God for the growth and progress of the believers in Thessalonica, he gave reminders that there is room for growth to excel still more. Likewise, let us as husbands and wives hear these reminders and press on and to excel still more in our love for one another and in our transparency before one another and in our speaking the truth in one another's lives as we make sure that we together do not return evil for evil and that we together seek to do good to one another in love. Well, let's talk for a minute about how this verse applies in the horizontal relationship between parents and children. 
fathers. Not returning evil for evil includes being careful to not exasperate, but instead being patient. Because our Father is patient with us. He knows our frame. He knows that we are but dust. He does not overburden us. He does not drive a threshing wheel over us. That's patience. Listen on these reminders from, from the Old Testament and the New Testament about fathers with their sons, with their, with their daughters. Proverbs 22, verse 6, an exhortation. Train up your child in the way sh- that he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Ephesians 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Again, Proverbs 19, verse 18. Discipline your son while there is hope, and do not desire his death. Proverbs 29, 17. Correct your son, and he will give you comfort. He will also delight your soul. Deuteronomy 11, 19, you know this one. You shall teach them to your sons, talking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you rise up. This is a very, very important uh, point to pay attention to, this quality or this this, um, practice of uh, being careful with your children. It's important because Paul includes this uh, when he talks about the faithfulness that is required for leadership. So it, it appears again when in Paul's reminder in First uh, Timothy uh, chapter five verse eight when he says, "When those when he's he's talking about those who, who to whom you should consider uh, as a candidate for being a leader in the church," he says, "But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith, and he's worse than an unbeliever." And then again in in chapter three verse four he says. Of, of these ones who would be qualified to be leaders among us, he says, he must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. So in light of verse 15, fathers, you may be tempted to return evil for evil by neglecting your duty to your children. Well, does this verse apply to children? It certainly does. It applies to children in this way, Exodus 20, verse 12, a command says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land. And James 1 gives us a framework of what kind of attitude a child might have toward his parents, her parents. James says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Ephesians 6 gives us this exhortation, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And again, an underlying attitude in Philippians 2, verse 4 says, do all things without grumbling or questioning. Proverbs 1, verses 8 and 9 says, hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland on your head and pennants Young people, you might be tempted to return evil for evil by thinking, how can I get back at my folks? How can I embarrass them? Embarrass them? Oh, this will show them. But certainly you can see that this command applies to all of us. It applies to everywhere, all of our horizontal relationships. Well, what about bosses and coworkers? Here from Paul, how he addresses both of these. In Ephesians 6, verse 5, he says to he uses the word in English bond servant, but it's slaves in those days. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and tem- trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or free. The, con- the, the conveyance of the right heart attitude there as a worker. Well, on the other side, masters are exhorted here in verse 9 of chapter 6. Paul says, Masters, do the same to them, to the co workers, and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both 
their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. So you may be tempted as a coworker to return evil for evil by slacking or by grumbling or even by refusing to be happy. It can be easy to self-justify walking around with a big grouchy frown. And note that this instruction to bond servants and masters or coworkers and bosses applies to, um, uh, I mean, this, this instruction to them and to parents and to children and to husbands and wives goes all the way back uh, to an attitude that Paul had conveyed in chapter 5 when he says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, I ask you, doesn't that sound like the right heart? This is yes. This is no. Does it sound like the right heart? It does. Well, what about... What about to non-believers? My relationship and my interaction with non-believers, do these commands apply to non-believers? Uh, do they apply to how I treat people that don't know Jesus, that don't love Jesus? Does it apply to how I treat those who hate and reject Jesus? What about to non-believers who are mean and mistreat me? Is it okay to pay them back? Good answer. That is exactly right. I am never justified to withhold good from them. And Paul answers this question very, very clearly. Look at the end of verse 15. He says, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seeks to do good to one another and to everyone. He makes it clear that these two commands extend to all of our horizontal relationships when through the Holy Spirit he writes, that no one repays anyone seek to do good to one another and to everyone so we've covered a very wide range of the horizontal relationships that we inter that we have that we interact with well now we might ask ourselves why do we seek to justify our selfishness why do we try to justify getting back at someone have, have we really been sinned against or could it be that we are oversensitive sometimes and simply reacting to something that was really not an offense. So here, I'm going to talk about oversensitivity. And what I mean by oversensitivity is this tendency to, to be quick to take an offense or to be offended or touchiness or getting our feelings hurt way too easily. Now, keep in mind, sensitivity is a very good thing. The Lord wants us to be sensitive to the needs of others. He wants us to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit so he can use us in, in his, and guide us in his, in his way. But here, sensitivity means taking the offense at the slightest provocation, it means being over irritable. You know, my mind oftentimes thinks in pictures, and I was thinking of, uh, you've seen these sea anem anemones, these uh, sea creatures that live at the bottom of the ocean. They, they collect uh, plankton as it swishes back and forth. Well, if you just touch one of these things, the, 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 the arm pulls in. Or maybe you've seen a video of a snail, you know, with the little antlers on its head crawling across, and maybe you touch one of those antlers and whoop, it just disappears. So that's this idea of oversensitivity. Or maybe one of those um, Venus flytraps, you know, just, you just blow on it and, it and it snaps shut. So that's the sense of this oversensitivity. Now, this oversensitivity comes from pride. It comes from selfishness and self-centeredness. We are hurt and deflated when others point out our mistakes. Let me give you a couple of verses here that describe this. Proverbs 29, verses 23, the first part of that says, A man's pride shall bring him low. And in Proverbs 11, verse 2, When pride comes, then comes shame or dishonor but with the lowly there is wisdom being oversensitive shows that we're really not holding on to the Lord or his word let me show you this from Psalm 119 and Isaiah 26 these are marvelous promises my brothers and sisters Psalm 119 verse 1 uh, verse uh, 165 says now listen 
great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Isaiah 26, 3, I love this. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Aren't those wonderful? So if you are oversensitive or if you see someone who's being oversensitive, they need a reminder to draw near to the Lord because they're not standing very close at that moment. A person who is oversensitive takes things personally and ends up believing the enemy's lies and becoming discouraged. Christians who are easily offended are not very strong and they have a lot of growing to do. So by way of reminder from what we looked at last week, what's our obligation? We need to strengthen them. We need to help them. Being oversensitive makes it difficult to receive counsel not being very teachable. Being oversensitive slows down training and it slows down someone's spiritual growth. Oversensitivity gets in the way of honest communication and it can undercut our relationships with one another. And as good soldiers in the Lord's army, army we need to toughen up a little bit or we risk becoming unuseful. The good news is that the Lord can help us overcome sensi oversensitivity if we are determined to change and obey. Well, let's consider now, let's pivot and consider how to obey this sixth and seventh command. <coughs> as the Lord groweth, as the Lord grows us, we would expect fewer and fewer offenses of evil against one another among us. It should lessen. But will these offenses come? Yeah, they'll still come. Some offenses from others are not intended, but some are. Even redeemed sinners still know how to shoot arrows. And until we see the Lord and the final vestiges of sinfulness and selfishness are removed forever from us, we will keep this capacity to hurt one another. Oh, Lord, how we look and long to see you. Come quickly, Master. Come quickly. Until then, we have to ask ourselves, how? How can we strengthen ourselves so that we are more and more inclined to obey these commands of not repaying evil for evil and always seeking to do good to one another and to everyone? How can we make sure, as we watch over our own souls, that we don't return evil for evil? And how do we console one another not to allow our fleshly selfishness practice this returning of evil to evil to one another. How can we grow in this, especially in a culture of shame and faiths? How can we apply this? There really is only one answer, and that is to forgive from the heart. And instead of retaliation, we should bless one another. We are obliged to do good, not only to those who are easy to get along with, but to everyone. And this is not enabled by some superhuman ability or some great personality. This is the heart and core of Christ's gospel. Christ is the example. Christ, the just for the unjust, endured patiently. My friends, hear the words of Jesus when he says in Matthew 5, verse 44, he says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes the son, his son rise on the evil and the good and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Paul reminds us in Romans 12, 17, he says, repay no evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of others. Our Father has forgiven us, the believers, a huge debt. He has forgiven, if he has forgiven your brothers and sisters, so likewise then you must also forgive them. Hear the words of your Savior Jesus, Matthew 6. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your Father, your Heavenly Father, will also forgive you. 
But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And again, Paul in Colossians 3 says, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so also must you forgive. So we must not stay, say, we must not remain selfish or self-absorbed. And so in addition to forgiving from the heart, there's a safeguard against returning evil for evil that you might want to consider these strategies for following through on the command of always doing good for one another and to everyone. So how do you do that? That is, you have to plan your obedience. We can plan how we will obey not returning evil for evil. In the heat of the moment, your sin, our sinful hearts can react. But when we are having fellowship with God and planning, we can think about the aggravations that will come, the little touches that we will receive. We can anticipate those and we can plan how we will respond. You know, may not know the details, but you can plan in advance your obedience. So as you hear these scriptures, I want you to think about them as avenues to help you, not to make you feel guilty, but to give you hope. With regard to our tongue, you might want to write down Proverbs 21, 23. Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from trouble. Psalm 141, verse 3, it's a, it's a request. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch on the doors of my lips. Verse, fifth, verse 1 of Proverbs 15 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stirs up anger. What about our temper and our sinful anger? Proverbs 14.29 says, Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is hasty exalts he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Do you want that to be you? I don't want that to be me. Proverbs 16, verse 32 says, Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Sinful anger is really an expression of false worship. When we express anger sinfully, we must ask ourselves, what am I not getting that I really want, that I'm willing to sin to get it? However you answer that question will reveal what you are living for in that moment. Something else has captured your heart more than God, and you are seeking satisfaction in something other than God. And you know what? This is idolatry. The only way forward is to surrender your anger to God. You can't control or manage it in your own strength. Let the Spirit move you and bring you to brokenness so that you can be changed. When we endeavor to have the attitude of Christ walking in submission to the Holy Spirit, we are much less likely to react to an offense by returning evil for evil. You can see then that by planning your obedience means prayerfully applying the truths of God's word into your own life. Through the help of the Holy Spirit, you can change. This is how we become imitators of Christ. Now, we've, we've looked at these commands and we've explored some of the personal application. We've talked about planning your uh, follow-through through obedience. Now, let's quickly look at the consequences of not obeying. If we are tempted to allow ourselves or one another to be okay with returning evil for evil and to be okay with withholding forgiveness and self-justifying as we sit in our own stew and get a royal pout on and build and sail a mighty scowl, we risk inviting serious injury to ourselves and to one another. So what's the consequence if we refuse to forgive from the heart? What is the consequence if we refuse to forgive from the heart? It's bitterness. Bitterness. 
What would bitterness look like between believers? <coughs> what would bitterness look like in a family? What would bitterness look like in a church body? We must be on guard, first over our own souls, and then be on guard for one another. We must, in kindness and gentleness, help one another to appropriately and effectively, through the application of scripture and the work of the Holy Spirit, not allow any root of bitterness to take hold in our lives. Well, in conclusion, let me remind you again about the underlying motivation. The motivation for obedience is love. The motivation to not allow a spirit of revenge, but instead to practice forgiveness from the heart is love. The motivation to always seek to do good to one another and to everyone is love. The motivation to help look after one another's heart among us is love. We are dependent on God to bring about the growth and maturity in us as we love. This morning, I hope that you have found insight into how you are walking before the Lord. I hope you have found some conviction. And most of all, I hope that you have found hope. That as you choose to submit your heart to the Master, you will see practical growth in your life as Christ followers. And that Christ will be glorified in and among us in our relationship. Oh, great God, your word through your word. Lord, your grace is sufficient. We ask that you help us to receive your grace in full. Lord, your Holy Spirit given us enables us to obey you. We ask you to help us to be soft and moldable and guided by the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to obey this command to never repay evil for evil, but to always seek to do good to one another and to all. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.